So we do this, you know, the dog and pony show, and then you come up and you 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 get to meet the president, you know, and we're sitting there, and, and I, I have this really cool picture. He's, you know, the president's shaking my hand, and he's he's shaking my hand, and he's got Arco by the ear, and he's petting him by the ear, and, and I'm sitting here looking. Is that a at good it. idea? Well, <laughs> I was looking at it, you know. Alan and I went, we went over this in our heads a bunch of times. It's like because you know the president's AIC was sitting right there. His his guy who's leaning forward. I'm in, I've got guns, mm -hmm. you know. I've got president. And we're talking, you know. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. How you feeling, son? Yeah. That kind of thing. And I really love the dog. And, and I'm you know loaded for bear. Right. He's so worried that you know something's going to happen. And, and Alan and I were like, you know what? I bet that would give us legendary status if for we sure. bit the president. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So Steve said, I got to talk to you, because when Steve and I talk, the first time we talk about all the special dogs, the special ops dogs, and um, comes to find out you actually started that up. Yeah, right? I, I was one of three, Okay, actually. So, so how this all sort of began was the, uh, there was a guy, his two guys, Pat McCauley and Alan Miller, uh, members of SOCOM, U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Uh, they came up with this really great idea because we were running into issues of uh, sort of structure clearing okay. was a problem. We, we, we ran into some issues with, with some things and we didn't really have a fix for it. Or we had a fix, but we didn't have the what we considered to be the best fix. Okay. So an idea came up about starting to use dogs and Pat and Alan wrote up proposals and and did you know what they were supposed to do and came up with you know this idea uh, about a proof of concept and bringing canines into SOCOM and canines in war is not new right. right with the military is not new but this particular niche that we were we were you know beginning to explore was has never been done but so there, there were, for years, there was dogs in Vietnam, World War Two, right? All that. Yeah, there's... all the way back to, you know, Spartan. Okay. You know. Uh, but what was the difference between those dogs and the ones that you wanted to put in? So historically, the legacy dogs are, are, are in the military. They're all under one umbrella, which was Lackland Air Force Base. Okay. Um, they were used in, as sentry dogs. They were used as detector dogs for dope, for, for explosives. Um, in Vietnam, uh, uh, tripwire dogs were, were very popular yeah, we're and tracking bad guys, very, very popular. Um, there is a Vietnam Dog Handlers Association and a lot of those guys that are in the Fort Bragg area, I reached out to to talk with them to figure out, you know, when we're doing this, what are the do's and don'ts? Uh, just looking for some feedback mm -hmm. from these guys who did it. Okay. And and what we wanted was something that worked a little bit closer with a with a with an actual operator, with a person mm -hmm. and and more direct action, not an attachment that did something off on the side, not not something that was an afterthought. It was this is this is the, what we're going to do. We're going to go over here, we're going to go clear this mm -hmm. and this is we're using a dog and he's going to be out in front. So a, a, there would be a team of operators and then there would be a team of dogs with those operators. Yeah, so a, a dog team would consist of a dog and a handler mm -hmm. and four or five of them, and that would make up a dog team. Okay. Um, and this, when we started, it, it was, you know, how, how do we, what do we do? How do we man this? Yeah. And, and the proof of concept was, let's just get two dogs here and let's get them approved to do what we wanted to do. And, and then we'll take it from there. And this was, you know, into 1998, 98 time frame into 1999. And I was the third person that got involved because I, I came across the hall or I graduated OTC at the end of 98 and became a junior operator and saw this program. And it was offered to me as a volunteer. Okay. Hey, who's interested in doing this? Right. And, and I, I just, I saw what they, I, I had the vision. It was like, oh, yeah, duh, this makes complete sense to me. You yeah. know, this is how a thermonuclear device works. It's just, and there it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's how, you know, it was my attitude towards, towards this particular program was, of course, this makes perfect sense. Yes, I want to be involved mm -hmm. in it. Absolutely. And so I was actually the third guy that was already, so I walked in to a, basically a, a room and two dogs. Okay. 
Alan Miller had one of them. Pat had the other one, but Pat was kind of cycling out and I became the next dog handler. Okay. And didn't have any formal training yet. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any type of, of uh, you know, experience with, with those working dogs in what we were doing other than, you know, uh, you know, years ago, I took a took a couple of bites at the local police department, okay, and yeah. you know, sort of sort of became interested in them. But my whole military career was, you know, dog free as far right. as I was concerned. I I just saw it as a as a viable tool for what we wanted, and way beyond that, which is pretty pretty brilliant insight. So at that time, the special ops weren't using dogs mm -mm. at all. No, okay, no, no. so none of the famous divisions of the military didn't have dog teams well just just the mps right that's the, what i'm saying yeah, yeah. no nobody in socom had a had a canine program none of them, okay. none of them. so you and these other guys guys steve is one of them who you who you picked you started this into the u.s military special yeah obviously. into socom right, so, so um, yeah when we got this approval um it was now let's hit the ground running what are we gonna do? You know, how are we doing this? So the the underlying theme of all of this was our main goal was, uh, you know, again, this is pre 9-11, so there was really not a whole lot of stuff going on, mm -hmm. but our main goal was how do we get these dogs into direct action mm -hmm. and how do we get them into a counterterrorism mindset? How do we use them in that community in that field in that genre that really hasn't even gone on yet yeah. they, these were just you know we uh, i worked with some of the smartest guys ever because they just had insight mm. and to be exposed to that type of insight it's like wow you know you were you were it's reinforced you want to think outside of the box think outside of the box do it come up with a plan come up with you know a good strategy mm -hmm. and sell don't you know sell it if it works but don't just you know, write some stuff down on a but post-it it's, note. It's brilliant insight because I mean, the more and we talked to a din dinner last night, the more I'm talking to you about it is like pre 9/11. I mean, okay, so there was some issues in the Gulf War, or whatever, but there was never a use for these kind of tactical or or, or, or combat kind of dogs. So there was military dogs, detection dogs, whatever. But this guy was a Pat McCullough. McCauley, yeah. McCauley. Mm -hmm. Um, started this idea and said, okay, why don't we do this? And then you're stepping in and starting a conversation that's never been had. Yeah, wow. so <laughs> the, the funny part is at one point when we were, you know, pushing these dogs to be in buildings with people, you know, at one point, I, I, and I hope Pat doesn't get mad at me, but at one point he said, we're never going to use dogs like this. This is never going to work. Oh, wow. And, you know, and, and it was like, mm, yeah, you but once, once it sort of took hold and, and you realized that, wow, we, we can actually do this. We can, we can, this, this will work. And we started getting other guys that are, you know, that are involved. Um, SOCOM is operator centric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything revolves around the operator. That's just the lay of the land. And if you have an issue with that, you're probably not going to be there very long. <laughs> and, and generally it's because you aren't an operator. Mm -hmm. Um, but once the other guys saw what we were attempting to do and, and were like, hey, wow, you know what, this might work, then it became so much easier to, I mean, we didn't even have a dog kennel yet. Wow. So this was, we were building this program and, and, and even at one point, uh, Alan, this was just even right before I got there, Alan had to just go off and train for six months with the Secret Service because it was like, you know what, dude, we need to get you and these dogs out of here because there's too many people that don't want them. Mm. So let's, you guys go off, gather data, get trained, start doing some stuff. And, you know, we were working with Brian Mowry and the Secret Service for a long time. And, and that was sort of our in to, you know, to a, a, the high-end canine stuff that was going on around the country um, because, when we started breaking this down as nuts and bolts, we were looking at high speed police dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, who is doing what we want to do with that? And we literally sat in a room and said, okay, who do we go to? So let's call Brian. Brian, who's doing this? Well, you know what? Go out there and talk to Kenny Licklider mm -hmm. in Indiana. So we did. We went out and talked to Kenny Licklider, and Kenny gave me a bunch of names. And then I went over here and talked to these guys, and I end up in, uh, Utah and in, in Salt Lake City 
talking with Wendell Nope, who had this reputation of being a SWAT dog guy, and he was never, I don't think he was even in a SWAT team, but he was training these SWAT guys. But when I was out there, I ran into this guy named Lane Kreitzer, who was the lieutenant in, the, in charge of the, the, the South Utah Sheriff's Department's dog program. And every one of his dog handlers were also SWAT guys. That was a criteria that he had. And I sat down with Lane, and, and you know, he and I became you know, pretty good friends. And uh, he kind of laid it out for me what we were doing. We would practice approaches, and is a dog being quiet? And you know, I went on a couple of ride-alongs with him, and, and it was, you know, we got to see the dog. There's a bad guy in the kitchen, and we're sitting at the kitchen door looking at him, and he's got a dog team on the other side, and he's ready to launch the dog into the room. This guy sitting in the kitchen with a knife, and, and it was really cool. And I was like, I, I'm starting to really go, you know, the, the wheels are now turning, turning going, yeah. holy, we can do so much more. Mm. Um, we can really make this happen. Uh, and then it, when, when, when that sort of began to blossom, we're now we're pushing into 2000, in early 2001, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time training at Von Lick Kennel with Ken. Okay. Um, he was the biggest vendor in North America, and he was the guy that was doing every police guy went down there. And I came across, you know, guys like Craig Patton Ken, and Steve Stoops. Yep. You know, that's where I met Steve. And I trained with Steve, you know, for almost a whole year through VLK. I, I spent, you know, probably seven months at VLK at one point huh. in a year, you know, just going over there, going to seminars, you know, doing the whole dog thing and uh, just building and building and building. And then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, that was an explosion that we were not really prepared for. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that really kind of solidified the, a need for what we were, what we were trying to do. Um, when you start any kind of program, you've got to have three variables need to be there. Number one, you have to have good people. Mm -hmm. You have to. You can't get anything done without good people. Number two, you have to have the support. And at that time, we had the support. Uh, and the other thing, the third thing is timing. There's got to be a catalyst in there that pushes you to the next level. And 9-11, it was exactly mm -hmm. that catalyst. Uh, and when that, you know, when 9-11 kicked off, the next thing we were, I was actually at the vet's office when, the, when the, we were watching it on TV. Alan and I, we were sitting in the vet's office with our two dogs watching the towers go down on television. Wow. And, and I'm sitting here looking at him and we're like, man, is this happening right now? Mm -hmm. uh, He's like, yeah, and the next thing you know, our pages are going off and we're getting, hey, you need to come back right away. Um, and we, you know, finished what we're doing at the vet. We get back to, to the compound. And the next thing you know, I'm in full kit with a Jeep sitting at the front gate with orders. If there is an aircraft inbound, you have to engage that. And we were just like, what? Wow. You know, this is a brag. Yeah, this was at Fort Bragg, right. and, and you know, apparently, it, you know, we were a possible. Could we have been a possible target? Yeah, what? I, I don't know, but yeah, you know, that I remember looking at my team leader, and, and, and his name was Chris, and, and he was like, uh, "This is just the most surreal." I mean, are you? I was like, "Are you serious?" He's yeah. like, "Yeah, here it comes," you know, and and he knew it. Um, uh, the funny one of the funny things about Chris, he was one of these guys who had vision, and and he he made us train a, a, a tactic that before nine eleven happened, that he said if if we're going to go to war and we want to go, we need to be proficient at this, and nobody else was doing it. People were calling us crazy. And, and this being the well, dogs. Nah, I'm, I can't really tell you oh, what okay, that okay. is, <laughs> but this is just kind of the vision that mm -hmm. that that I you know that these guys had. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just big picture, you know, magic, mm -hmm. you know, why, you think, why would you ever think of that? You, you know? think it's based on Intel or it's based on just pure gut? No, I think it's probably well, both. Okay. I think, you know, I, I think if you're, you know, reading every Intel brief, you're going to be smarter than everybody. Mm -hmm. If you're reading more, you're going to be a little bit more in the And note. these guys were reading those. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that was one of the things you did. And I don't think people even get that is... I, I could come into my team room every morning. There's a computer right there with an Intel brief. Mm -hmm. You better read it. Just read it. Mm -hmm. Know what's going on. Of course, I never read anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how close were you? Because you're standing this up in 2000, 2001. How close are you 
to you're you're about to go really apply this stuff, right? Yeah. In a couple so of months. so it, it was uh, you know one of the one of the best things in my military career was we got the call to conduct a, the retaliatory strike uh, against Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Okay. Um, and that particular strike was Operation Gecko, and you can you can look that up. It's on the internet. I did now. last night. Yeah. <laughs> and and. Uh, and, and it was, uh, you know, it's, you know, touted as the longest helicopter infill in U.S. military history. Um, and we literally, me and a bunch of my friends got into some helicopters and we did a raid on mm -hmm. the president of Afghanistan's home just outside of Kandahar. And, uh, and it was, you know, that was awesome. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, and that was, uh, that was one of the coolest things we had ever done. Let's talk um, about that. Talk about Operation Gecko because I read about it on Business Insider. There's yeah, little, yeah. Like, there's a little Newsweek thing that was out there. So when when we actually infilled in our, our piece of it at, at this particular time, I was the team breacher. So it was my job to put a charge up on a wall, blow a hole in the wall, and we're going to run into the compound and you know, hut hut hut, do our thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we landed on the south side of, of the compound, and we when we got off the helicopter, we were taking fire from a. a a guard tower mm. behind us and we had set things up to where we were going to neutralize the guard tower we had all of that thing mm -hmm. and when we looked at the imagery there was this mm -hmm. ditch this culvert because it was in it was being it was still sort of under construction okay this giant ditch and i don't know when, when you wear night vision at night sometimes holes appear to be shadows mm -hmm. so you can't okay. really can't really see it that well okay. it's just kind of a black spot on the ground so i've got this charge on my shoulder and i'm doing my thing and we all exfil off the back of, of the helo and, and i literally i know that there's this ditch coming up okay and, and we had looked at it we had said make sure you be you know, make sure everybody's careful I launched over that thing boom hit the ground on the other side and i'm running to where my breach point is and then I, I look to my right and my left, and there's nobody there. None of your team? None of my teammates were there. <laughs> and I'm just sitting here going, you know, for that brief moment, I've got this big smile on my face, and I, I, what am I supposed to do? Just keep running. Right. Keep going where I know the general direction of where I need to go. And then the, in a few seconds later, guys start catching up to me and passing me. And, and at the end of it, they fell in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I, they got shot? I, I, no. Well, I, who knows? <laughs> who knows you know, right? we, we, like I said, we had, there was gunfire and, and you're like, mm, that, that can't be good, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think it, you know, to me, it wasn't what, what I would call effective fire. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I jumped that ditch and for, for about, you know, five or 10 steps, there's nobody there. I'm like, what the heck? What do I do now? <laughs> it's not a good feeling. No, it's like, it's, you know, you guys are just really harsh in my mellow by yeah. not being here. <laughs> right. You know, you really are. Right. And, Again, it was a sort of a blink, and the next thing I know, Pat and Alan pass me, and my you know Dutch passes me, another guy, and and we're all right there, and we get to the, the breach, and we do what we were supposed to do, and I blew a perfect hole in a wall uh, to make entry into this compound. Okay, and uh, you know, as a breacher, that's what you do. You you train for that. You build the charge. You do mm -hmm. everything for it. You care for it. And mm -hmm. I was, a, a, you know, a happy charge. A, a neat charge is a happy charge. And you know, you're like, gosh, well, what happens if something happens on the way? And it's like, dude, don't don't be the guy who gets don't no trip breach. With yeah. It. yeah, don't do the no breach <laughs> thing. Oh, we can't get in here. We right. have to go somewhere else. You know, and right. and we're doing this all around this compound, and everybody's going in and rushing in and. and and to me, it was an unbelievably great time. So this is right after 9-11, right? Yeah, this was very shortly after. Did you have a dog with you on this mm, mission? No, okay. we did not bring them. Uh, again, th this was, this was a, what we call a DA operation, a direct action operation, but we had not yet figured out how do they fit. Yeah. Um, you can't make a plan for the dog. So when you plan something, you plan it. Mm -hmm. you, you don't make the plan surrounding the dog. The dog has to fit the in plan. the plan some right. way. And, and that's, we, we sort of stuck with that. From We were very adamant about a lot of things, and that was one of them is we're not going to create a job for the dog. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that because it won't, it won't last. Sure. Uh, and so that's when we sort of, you know, in this particular, I mean, we hadn't even been around. We really weren't up and running full time for, you know, a couple of years. 
Okay, you so know. since so 2003 is when you started really getting the so yeah so after after 9/11 and uh, Alan I, I was actually hurt uh, we we were conducting follow on operations and I was in a helicopter crash uh, I was uh, riding an MH6 Little Bird and uh, sort of crashed as we were conducting a, secre- a perimeter check mm-hmm. of because we were exfilling off of a tar- off of our, our patrol we were going back home and because of the brownout and the situation that we were in the airplane went, ended up bouncing on the desert floor and you know spinning around nose diving in and Alan and I ended up underneath it the, the skids gave way, so I had to skid across my arm and my body. Alan had the other, he was on the other side of the airplane, so he, he had both this, sides. Yeah, both sides. We were sitting on it, and, and we got pretty, I mean, I got banged up pretty badly. I mean, my face took a, a big shot for because I was wearing nods, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, it just got big, swelled up, and, you know, I was trying to ask all the guys give me your morphine syrup come on hook me up you know <laughs> right. i need give me give me you know it's like come on man i'm, I'm a serious plane and, and my my friend rick english who, who was our medic is god god bless rick he was sitting in the back of a vehicle and in the very back of a machine of, of the vehicle was a machine gun a 240 golf machine gun mounted on the back of the vehicle and he was sitting right next to it when we crashed the machine gun fell in his lap and the tail rotor struck the ground, shot over to where the vehicle was, and cut the the metal pentel that the machine gun is mounted on, and it just dumped in his lap. Like from from you to I, from me to you, this is where it was. Just fell right into him, and, and no one knew what that was. You know, it's like had he been leaning forward, mm-hmm. that thing would have just sliced him like butter. You know, so that's, you know, that's when, when a piece of metal hits the ground after it's doing this, you know, we spun and nose dived in and I was hanging out of the, the off the, the pod with a, a lanyard mm-hmm. and we ended up, you know, under the, under the helicopter. And, and it was horrible. I mean, I was in so much pain. That was 2001? Yeah, that was the end of 01. Uh, I'm not, you know, the, the exact date is not really right, important, right, right. It no, was, no. but it was just... You know, it wasn't that long after 9-11. So 9-11, then Operation Gecko. Now mm-hmm. you're on a tra- this was a practice mission that you were on when this happened? No, was this, was, this, was, this was a retaliatory strike against Al-Qaeda. This was another one? No, this was... Part of Gecko? Yeah. Oh, oh no, 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 no. This was a follow-on from Gecko. That's what I, was, that's yes, what I thought. Yes, right? so okay. this, was, this was an additional. Yeah, so when, once we finished Gecko, we, we you know, and filled back, and, and we were doing it, and we started conducting follow-on operations. Got it. So and, Gecko went clear. Yeah. Right. And then we, then you you've got another follow on mission. Yes. And this is when the helicopter crashes. Yeah. And you get injured. Mm-hmm. Now you're sent back to the states for what happened. Went there. To, yeah. Went to went to a forward staging area for a while, and then I end up in launch stool. And and you know the, I think the thing that I remember most about the forward staging area was uh, uh, Pat bringing Arco. Arco's your dog. Oh, my dog mm-hmm. bedside because he was in country with us. He just was not on that particular operation. Um, because we just weren't using him like that yet. Right. Um, but you had him with you. Mm-hmm. Oh, I yeah. didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah, he was, he, was in, he was in a kennel in country, in, in a big tent. And, uh, you know, if, if we could, we would have tried to figure out a way to use him. And you were deploying from where when you were doing that? So you were in, you were in Ger- launch tools in Germany. Yeah. Right, that's where. But where were you launching? Because you were going to Afghanistan. Yeah, we were someplace else. Okay, got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Outside of Afghanistan and yeah. not in Germany, but right. somewhere else. Somewhere okay. else. <laughs> But then you went to Lanshu, which was where the hospital yes. was. Yes, right? so that's where you, they send all the, the, the hurt guys. And, and they brought your dog to Germany. No, no, not to Germany. Oh. To when I was at the forward area prior to Germany. Got it. So okay. I went from the ground to a forward area to, a, to an army hospital. Mm-hmm. Then from there to Lanshtool. And okay. when I was at the, on the forward area, they, gave, they brought Arco to me. And, and it, was, it was just completely awesome. It was two things. You know, you, you talked about your chocolate. Mm-hmm. needs another good buddy of mine his name is Joel Kazarowski came in with like a three pound bag of M&M's and slid it over to me because he knew what a junkie <laughs> I was when it comes to chocolate right, right. so I've got Arco over here uh my bag of M&M's over here and, and I'm you know if if I could feel good yeah it was right then that, that was you know with I, a crushed I, pelvis given and yeah <laughs> given <laughs> given everything that had happened you know bones sticking out of this way and all that kind of stuff I felt as good as I could because of those yeah. two things and yeah. uh and, and I was you know so grateful just 
completely wow. grateful that that happened. How long were you laid up for after? Because I'm sure during this time you'd already started the program. You, you're on this mission. You get injured in another mission. And now you're laid up for yeah. quite some time. So I end up going home. I end up getting back to the States. You know, I had four or five surgeries when I was in launch stool. And it was just cleaning everything up mm -hmm. and, you know, checking you out again. And I ended up going back to the States. Um, and I went home for about 30 days. Uh, and my mother was a massage therapist. So when the skid landed on my arm, it blew the ulnar nerve right open like a book. Now, here, here's the, a, a funny part. Uh, when I was at that forward staging area, a crew chief came in and he wanted to see the guy who still had his arm from a skid injury because somehow, and, and this is a true story, somehow inside, that air, inside the airplane, there was the pilot's flight crew checklist. It's this plastic book. Okay. Eight, eight, nine, eight by eight, nine by eight, uh -huh. whatever. It's got, you know, big ring binders and it's covered in plastic and you go through your checklist, right. right? That thing fell out of the airplane and landed right here. And when the skid hit it, it folded it up and it tamped my arm enough, protected my arm enough to where it didn't take the arm. And because it, 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 we were peeling it off and I was like, you know, at, at first I had no idea what the hell was going on because, you know, I, was, I had blacked out. I was unconscious for a while. Um, and then they put it in a bag and it's just gnarled up bloody thing, you know, and, and the, the lanyard too. I kept the lanyard for a while. It was covered in blood. Now it just got funky mm -hmm. and, and I threw it out. But the lanyard ended up being too long. Um, and that was one of the, you know, the takeaways from that. When you, you start thinking about, well, what did you learn from this? Well, we shortened the hell out of the lanyard is right. what we did. Because you wouldn't have fallen out of the cockpit. Well, it, who knows? But it, it stretched. Mm -hmm. the, the elasticity of it, it stretched enough to where it allowed us to go underneath the aircraft. So we just shortened it up to make sure that um, you know, who would have thought, you know, guys in kit with that kind of force. I mean, we were literally outside of the airplane as it was doing this. Uh, and I was... Uh, you know, I had no idea that it would stretch that much to where when the when the aircraft nosed down and fell, mm -hmm. that it, we would end up under it. Um, and, and I remember I, I asked Alan a couple of times, you know, would you did you ever think about jumping out? Right. You know, and, and I, 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 I thought for a minute when when I'm looking underneath the aircraft, looking at the brownout and, and I can lean forward and see directly underneath it. And it's pretty much clear. And the pilot is yelling 30 feet, and we're about 10 feet away. So we hit the ground really hard, and by design, the skids give way. But mm -hmm. when it did that, the back of the aircraft plunged downward, mm -hmm. and the tail rotor broke. And when the tail rotor broke off and the airplane picked back up, there was no control over it. So it just started spinning, mm -hmm. and then whoosh, whoosh, nose down and fell. And uh, when that happened, you know, we were under it. And you know, I was like, dude, did you ever think about jumping out? And I was like, I think for a minute mm -hmm. and for a second, I thought, shit, man, I better jump. But you were strapped but, in. But yeah, we were strapped in. And it was <laughs> like, you know, I was on the radio yelling, Alan, 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 man, you know, wave off, wave off, wave off. And he was, you know, we were on ICS and the internet, you know, the internet, the internal comm system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were trying to tell every, you know, tell a pilot to wave off. And there's guys on the ground, you know, trying to wave him off. But he looks at the horizon and he sees it and he's going to stick it. Mm -hmm. And it's his call. You know, he's a man. So, uh, you know, this is one of those things. Stuff happens. Yeah. You know, it's, it's danger. And it's interesting because the pilot came up to me. Um, I'm in the aircraft uh, when we're leaving and I'm sitting on the hood of a vehicle. And, you know, he got me on a stretcher and he comes up to me and he starts apologizing to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, seriously. You know, I don't, is there a long line of people that really want this job? <laughs> right. You know, right. <laughs> it takes a certain, you know, kind of person to do what you're doing and yeah. stuff is going to happen, sure. you know. So uh, so that's sort of, you know, what happened to me. And, and when I got home, you know, uh, the more I was medically evaluated, the worse I became. Mm. And, and it just sort of snowballed and downhill from there. And I, I ended up in a point in, in 2004. And while this is going on, all this medical stuff is going on. I'm back on my feet. I'm trying to rehab. I'm trying to do this. But I'm still, now I'm a lot more active in the dog program. Okay. Alan was overseas handling a dog now. And, and, and he, he was the first SOCOM dog handler to conduct operations with a canine 
he was the first one and, and they were doing some super cool stuff okay. uh in, in afghanistan right after that um and uh that's really when we started we started to to gain a lot of momentum mm -hmm. um but and, you're back here yeah i was back in the states right uh just trying to get better and it was funny so president bush came to the compound and the very first we did this you know we call it a capex this capabilities exercise we did this little thing where i'm riding in a little bird and guy gets out of a car and the dude runs and i jump out of the bird you know and the dog chases him and you know does this really super cool thing that was the first time i was in a little bird since that crash and the first time i got in it uh, you know the day before i met condi condoleezza rice and uh -huh. she's like well the president's really going to want to talk to you because you have a dog and i was like yeah, yeah like know. that right yeah it was cool <laughs> and uh so we, we were doing this rehearsal and I'm sitting here in this, you know, and we're zooming around doing all this kind of stuff. And I was like, man, I'm going to be pissed if I fall out. <laughs> Especially for the uh, Yeah, I was just, this is just so, <laughs> you know, because I, I was, I was, oh, I, my arm was still pretty much just kind of useless wow. because of the on the nerve problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just kind of sitting there and I got kid on, I got all my guns and I'm, you know, doing my thing, sitting down with the dog. When he made the apprehension, when the dog got there, I couldn't get him off the bite. <laughs> it was so hard to no get him out. going. I, it didn't, well, that wasn't going to work right. because there's a helicopter <laughs> yeah. right here and right. there's a dude in a bite suit right there and you know, the president's watching everything. And, you know, it's like I just couldn't get him off. It took a while for you me. You didn't to, have the strength in your yeah, hand. Yeah, I didn't have the strength in my hand. So yeah. it's like, mm, man, this <laughs> is going to be horrible. I finally, we got him off. I was like, come on, dude, please, just let go. <laughs> right. Just this one time, just let go. <laughs> it was so sad. Just for the devil. <laughs> it is. So we do this, you know, the dog and pony show, and then you come up and you 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 get to meet the president, you know, and we're sitting there, and, and I, I have this really cool picture. He's, you know, the president's shaking my hand, and he's he's shaking my hand, and he's got Arco by the ear, and he's petting him by the ear, and, and I'm sitting here looking. Is that a at good it. idea? Well, <laughs> I was looking at it. You know, Alan and I went. We went over this in our heads a bunch of times. It's like because you know the president's AIC was sitting right there. His his guy who's leaning forward. I'm in, I've got guns, mm -hmm. you know. I've got president. And we're talking, you know. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. How you feeling, son? That kind of thing. And I really love the dog. And, and I'm you know loaded for bear. Right. He's so worried that you know something's going to happen. And, and Alan and I were like, you know what? I bet that would give us legendary status if for we sure. bit the president. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> never happened. You know, I think that would be kind of cool. But Arco was perfect. You know, he was. Uh, I don't know if uh, if we let the president look at Alan's dog because Bart, he was a duchy and mm -hmm. he was a little bit mean. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you something because now we're talking, we talked about this with Stoops too, and I've talked about it with him privately, and we talked about it. When you first did the program, you thought you were going to get these man stoppers, right? Yeah. But your decision to change that, and now you've got this dog, Arco, does that help you to feel more comfortable knowing that this dog is not just going to go off on any anybody who's going to be near him? Oh no, Arco would have gone off on anybody. Oh, so Arco, yeah, Ar Ar Arco, pre yeah. Arco okay. was a little etchy. He was a little edgy. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, he he would not have been the I I I'm not going to say that because because of my status, he did not get to work as much as we would have liked mm -hmm. as our first dog. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's a Mal, right? He's a Mal, yeah. yeah. And yeah. he's got drive through the roof, you know, okay. for days. And when we really started to to get bigger, I sat in this, you know, video conference call with, you know, the, the SOCOM commander. Um, and he was like, we want you guys to build this dog program for SOCOM. And we want, you know, we want you to come up with these numbers. And can you do it in three weeks? You know, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, and of course I said, well, yes, sir, we can. We can do anything you need. Just let us run. Right. Um, but it was Pat who sat back and said, mm -mm, not going to do it. We're going to keep this within the unit proper, and we will help everyone. You know, Pat and Alan were both extremely adamant about this, and, and I'm really glad that they were like that because we were able to do things on our own. You know, we had the autonomy to do what we needed to do, and we were able to push these lessons learned to other people you know, units that were in SOCOM. And we did. We spoke with everybody. We spoke with the Navy. We spoke with, you know, the Green Berets. We spoke with the Rangers. We spoke to MARSOC. We spoke to everybody to try and help them get on. We, and we didn't do it for them, mm -hmm. but we told them, you know, 
what we did. We told them what we did well, and we told them what we did horribly. Okay. And, uh, and and it seemed to work. You know, it, it worked out really well. They went out and got their own dog guys, and we went out. We, we were in the process of doing this. And then, you know, when Iraq kicks off, we were we were ready. Mm-hmm. We had actually had operational dog teams ready to go. But when, the, so good, good, yeah. So we had operational dog teams ready to go. And at this point, we, our kennel facility wasn't even finished. Wow. So we were, you know, we were really playing catch up. And, and, and I reached a point to where it became, we're getting bigger. I have to go out because at this point I am the sort of the program manager. Mm-hmm. Um, Pat and Alan were off doing other things. They were, you know, they were doing combat stuff. And, and I was not fit to do that yet. And, uh, and subsequently never became fit. And at the end of, and by 2004, it was like, look, dude, you're, you're on a permanent profile. You're not, things aren't going to work out for you. What do you want to do? Do you want to stay? We can hide you. You can be, you know, you can be a heavy breacher. What, what I should have done is stayed in the squadron and let the squadron protect me. But I was like, nah, I'm just going to stay with the dogs, man. I'm going to stay with the dog program. And I ended up retiring and just automatically becoming, uh, you know, a contractor, became a contracted civilian uh, in the dog program and hit the ground running. You know, I was in Iraq as an active duty soldier. And the next day I had retired and I was no longer active duty. I was, you know, a, a contractor um, as a contracted dog trainer. And we, we had, you know, we had, I had, I went out and hired, that was my job when I got back from Afghanistan and prior to Iraq getting really popular and busy was to go out and expand the program and find guys who will fit here and who, who we can say, who know how to train a dog, the kind of dog that we're looking for, who know how to select the type of dog we're looking for. And, and because of my relationship with Steve, I've, you know, I, I hired Steve is I, I asked Steve to come work for us before he was retired as a police officer. Mm-hmm. So you brought Steve into that. Yeah, I, I went out and hired him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We hired another guy uh, from Colorado first, um, and he came, uh, and, and he was the initial you know, head trainer. Um, and then Steve was the second one. And then from there, we our kennel facility grew. Our, our, the numbers of dogs grew as, you know, as our operations in Iraq, we got super, super busy. As the op tempo increased, the number of dogs that we had, the number of dog, uh, you know, operations that we were doing increased. Um, we exploded as far as an expansion is concerned. Where do you get these dogs at this point? Well, we were going overseas. Uh, initially, we got them from VOK. Uh, we went to Ken, and he, you know, in and, and the, and the late 90s and early 2000s, there were still a lot of dogs that were coming, you know, coming overseas, coming from Europe to here. And uh, you had, you could go over there at any time and find a dozen really nice dogs, you know. And what are it, you looking for, though? <clears throat> well, initially, we were looking for big man stoppers, mm-hmm. and, and that was, that ended up being really problematic and we didn't realize it was going to be problematic because of the way that we had envisioned these dogs working and how we chose them and how we selected them the the man stoppers was the wrong temperament why we well we were working closer and closer with our own people Mm -hmm. so it wasn't just it was a dog team a dog was now being around a bunch of good guys going in and conducting operations and I'm not going to say there needs to be a dis, you know a discriminatory capability. The dog needs to discriminate, but he kind of does. He kind of needs to know what the difference in a good guy and a bad guy is. And some of these man stopping police dogs that we had you know saw and, and read about and trained with, you know, they're outside working the perimeter. They're going to bite anybody. They don't right. care. But it, it's it's the way that you train them too, mm-hmm. and it's the way that they were raised. These big man stopping dogs, especially with KPV in Holland, which were our, most of our dogs were titled. The majority of them had a Metloff title, you know, had a Metloff score. So they were really high scoring dogs. But, you know, as well as I do, they're they're pretty tough on them, yeah. you know, and and they're not afraid to, to bite. Mm-hmm. And um, that turned out to kind of transform into something that we didn't need. So that's something really important. I think that people don't understand because police dogs are in the back of the car. They go out, they do a job, they come back. Your dogs are riding next to another team member in yeah. a helicopter they have to they could be stuffed into a helo with 14 other dudes 
So you, you know, really want a dog that's like what Steve was saying, social. Yeah, we, we, and that, that was the, the, the term that we had coined was the social gorilla. Mm -hmm. We want this big man-stopping dog that is going to run through fire for you and is going to attack and do what he's supposed to do. But in the same breath, at the end of the day, he's going to sit on the couch right next to six other people that he doesn't, you know, who just come into the dog room. How do you train, how do you differentiate that i mean for for the average person listening to this so you've got a dog that when you tell him to go he's going to run through fire he's going to get that bad guy he's going to locate and dominate steve's shirt right, right. Mm -hmm. locate and dominate that bad guy but we're hanging out having some beer sitting on the couch shooting the, the breeze he's not going to bite us no <clears throat> how does that work <clears throat> well me personally a lot of it is the dog selection but the other part is is the hand is the guys around you so so now our, our our training regiment was making a bunch of mini dog handlers out of everybody around you so you're not hanky when you're around them you're not walking up to them climbing all over the top of them you're doing what you're supposed to do you let him get to know you let him you know don't walk up and you know get all uh, right. you know want to fight with Kisses. him all the time yeah get your face away from his face kind of thing and when we started doing that, we started to see that, wow, you know what? They're, they're not as, as ugly as, as we thought they were. Mm -hmm. But we were also choosing them with those traits already in them to where, you know, you, if, if you've, you've seen some of these dogs where you go up to them, it's like, mm, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to test you right now. You want to <laughs> test them at arm's length. Yeah. What the heck? You know, that, that's not, I, I want a dog who's willing to put his feet right up on me, mm -hmm. put his feet on my shoulders and let me pick him up. And I've mm -hmm. never seen him before. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, and then I'm expecting him to do everything that I'm asking him to do mm -hmm. without fail. And, that's you know, <laughs> at some point you've got to, you know, you got to figure it out and you, you've got to, you know, you got to compromise it sometimes. And, you know, you may have to train him a little mm -hmm. bit. You know, the old saying that we use is I may have to train the lad. Yeah. Well, you can't pick a finished dog. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. You're looking for those characteristics that make him brave, make him courageous, but he's extremely social. And, and I think after, you know, two or three years, after that first group of, say, that first group of like a dozen dogs, man, they were big, tough I mean, really tough and did fantastic work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most, a lot of those dogs were, you know, killed in combat. Um, but they, but they also bit some good guys. And, and, and that was something that we really had to get a hold of. Yeah. Uh, and, and educating everybody else around the dog was, was, you know, that, that, that was a really big part of the answer. So that combination of, people not being scared, mm -hmm. not being hinky, knowing the dog's name, knowing how to approach it, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, that was extremely helpful in, in, you know, getting that dog to where we wanted it, to where you could put him in a, in a helicopter with 10 people, with detainees mm -hmm. in there and people in there. And, you know, if push comes to shove, put a muzzle on him. Right. You know. So you pick these dogs. At what age would you go start selecting a dog at? Like what, what's the bottom age you would use? So when we started uh, in Holland, you couldn't find a titled dog under the age of two. Sure. You just, they just didn't make them that way. That, that was the KMPV was a very difficult title to get. Mm -hmm. um, a, as the war progressed and the demand for these animals shot skyrocketed, you started seeing younger and younger dogs getting titled. Then you started seeing younger and younger dogs that were untitled, but they were K and PV trained. Potential. And then the next thing you saw was just total green dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like getting a dog under 18 months. Oh, okay. um, me personally, mm -hmm. because we're going to put him through a training program and then he's going to work. Mm -hmm. We really didn't have the time to let him grow and mature like you would a 12 month old. Sure. I would have loved to have had a dozen 12 month old dogs if I had had a year or two to build them. Mm -hmm. That would have been tremendous. But we just didn't have the time. So we kind of had to, you know, find that happy medium. Yeah, 14, 15 months, you know, it just depended on the actual animal and those, those individual characteristics of each dog because they were all so different. So from the time you got them at, 18 months, let's say, how long of training did you need with them to get them ready to deploy? 
I want to say we had a six to eight, it was a six to eight week training program, you know, a real tough one. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had a handler course. We would pair them with a handler. If, if, we, if we had the ability to do that, we would want to give a dog who had had training already to a new handler okay. before he went to a training course. Mm -hmm. And the training course, we, we were putting those on. Um, we did that. We did our own. So um, that was the ideal situation. I know, you know, Stoops, I think, trained a dog in a couple of weeks or something to get a dog out there to deploy. <laughs> but that was, a, you know, that, that's obviously, you know, a circumstance. That's not the norm. That's mm -hmm. an exception. You know, you've got a, a, when you've got a, a senior handler and, and, sure. and an exceptional dog. You can make that work. But I, I can tell you right now, I came unglued when that little scenario went down mm -hmm. because I was not a, a big supporter of pushing a dog forward who did not start and finish mm -hmm. you know our four six week training program that we had because uh you know just that just wasn't fair that wasn't sure you, that's just something you did yeah you know yeah. you know if you talk about a certification that would have been you know what we had we're not going to have somebody come in and and tell us you know test our dog or anything like that but we're going to stick to our program and make sure that that dog is the best that he can be when he's getting out there because you know it's, it's too important mm -hmm. you know you're talking about saving um, and and that was the, the really big thing what we measured success by we did not measure success by getting a dog on a target sure. we measured success by getting a dog on a target and doing good things mm -hmm. conducting operations finding bad guys finding explosives that was a successful dog not a dude that got out not just some dog that got out there mm -hmm. oh yeah he, he did one hit yeah okay great so um, what so what are these dogs going to they're, they're coming off camp, even whether they're titled or not, but they're definitely used to it. They, they understand the picture, right? Mm -hmm. What are you training them to do? Like, what are you adding to their training to make them ready for your stuff? So, uh, obviously, the we thought a high powered patrol dog was what we were sort of looking for. Mm -hmm. So, building searches, area searches, tracking, not so much tracking because we just, that's something that takes a little bit more time than mm -hmm. we were willing to invest. And it's really not conducive to our mission set. Um, it takes too long. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're, we're, we may not be on the ground that long. Okay. Um, so, really, those three or four basic patrol dog tasks. And, you know, Steve and I used to sit around in a room with a dog and say, what if? What if we did this? What if we did that? Well, you know, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. And, and I, I was, you know, our, our chemistry was what was really cool because, you know, Steve is just, uh, you know, the hippie guru dog guy. He was a purist in every sense of the word. And I'm the guy who's coming from the unit, who was a unit member. And I'm like, no, we're not doing that. Or yes, we can do that. Or this is how we can do that. So our, our chemistry was really good. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we would sit in a room and, and we would, you know, make this choreograph this thing in our heads about a dog entering a building with a guy and start off with a tennis ball and do this thing. And then we would add another person and then we would add another person. And the next thing you know, this dog is running through a building, clearing it with a team. You know, with a group of guys. And so when you're saying add a person, you're saying add a person as a support to the dog. Yes, okay. as a support to the dog. And and we had it in mind that this dog is going to be running next to a group of men that are assaulting a structure. Mm -hmm. And that's what we wanted the dog to do, is to be able to, when he needed to be off leash, is to go out, you know, locate and dominate. Then come back, and any member of that team could at some point grab that leash, grab that line, whatever, and send a dog somewhere. Wow. That, was, that was the whole idea behind having a group of mini dog mm -hmm. handlers. They're, that's not their job. But they could. But they could, hey, if I, hey, I need to send a dog into the room. Well, the handler's on the other side, dude. Work it out. So we would teach guys how to do it. Hey, I'm not going in there. I need, you know, boom, canine, boom. He called the dog's name, zoom, and work it out. Mm -hmm. So we, we started this choreographing this dance this way. And we're really super successful in in uh, diminishing the number of friendly bites that we had, um, and we had a few. We had a few bad ones too. It's always going to happen. Right? Yeah. Well, how, how bad? Uh, well, <laughs> a couple of them were real bad. A couple of them looked like murder scenes. <laughs> we, so we bought we bought a dog. His name was Wilson, and, and Wilson was one of our early dogs. I, I told you this story. Um, he was a big, big, healthy, ninety pound, eighty pound Malinois, big, wow. tall dog, 
uh, one of our early dog handlers, a guy named Chris Dutch Moyer. And, and Chris was, uh, you know, he was a hard charging guy, served with him and Rangers. He and I were buddies. And uh, he, you know, wanted to be a dog. He had two Dalmatians. So he was a dog guy from perfect. day one. He was perfect for the job. <laughs> and, and he was, he took Wilson out of the kennel to break him. And I don't know why he did that. He did that because he's, you know, he's taking initiative. He's doing what he's supposed to do, whatever. But when he tried to put that dog back in the kennel, it became a big, ugly fight. Mm -hmm. And and when we got to the kennel, we had heard there was an accidental bite with Chris involved. When I when we got into the kennel, it was a bloodbath. I mean, <laughs> there was blood all over the walls. It was it was like, dude, were you like hand combat with this dog? He was like, yeah. He he pushed the dog off of him. The dog would come back. He'd smash it. You know, smashing a kennel door on the dog. And, you know, it, it became a really ugly fight. Wow. And uh, who won? Yeah. Uh, well, Chris. Thank goodness. But <laughs> you know, but Wilson bit me. Wilson bit Alan. Wilson bit Chris. I mean, well, the only person that will, the only person really that Wilson didn't buy. Stoops. Bit, no, no. Stoops stayed away from Wilson. <laughs> was Pat because okay. because and Pat was you know big tall guy and, and Pat was there when we purchased Wilson. Yeah, Wilson bit me when we bought him, and we still, still bought, him. bought him. Yeah, we still bought him. <laughs> That's commitment right there. <laughs> it is. But, it, and, you know, it, it was funny. Pat took the dog off of me, and, and he was telling me the story. I was like, well, what were you doing? So he's just, the dog is covered with my blood, and Pat's just walking him around in a heel, you know, <laughs> trying to get him, okay, let's put the dog away. i got to get me to the hospital. You know, I've got drain tubes sticking out of my <laughs> arms and stuff from this big, huge, vicious dog. Um, but we ended up firing him it is and, fire, and yeah. that was, but he was, you know, he was one of the first, these big mean man stoppers wherever he ended up doing some serious damage to a police officer where he ended up. And, and I don't, I'm pretty sure that dog probably got put, yeah. you know, put to rest. Yeah. Um, but, uh, that was, but that was what we thought we needed. And the more that we conducted operations, the further, that it, it it became evident re relatively quickly that we needed to to change yeah. our selection process, and uh, we did. So we 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 would we had a couple of females. Uh, I, I, we we talked about this story last night. HBO did a special on dogs, mm -hmm. and one of our dogs, Pepper, she was a IPO three female male, wow. very pretty, very, but just a super super dog mm -hmm. would sit there and jump in your lap and want to play with you and wrestle with you and everybody loving it. Uh, her handler was Dave and, and a guy named Dave and, and he took her out on an operation and, and we ended up losing the dog. And, and you know, the, the, the entire assault force stayed out there until it was unsafe to be out there any longer because they, they were committed to finding the dog. Can and, you tell that story though? Cause it's a really powerful story. Um, the, so the gisting of it is they, they conducted an operation and, and I was watching uh, an ISR feed. I was watching this on, on a video and uh, the dog on two separate occasions was released to, to go find a bad guy and, and engaged, you know, two separate times. I think she engaged a guy and the second time, because we were the, the the target was next to a body, it was next to a river. And the second time, she never came back. And and so basically, once the target was cleared and, and everything was done, they stayed on the target. And all of the support aircraft that were there were looking for the dog. We, I mean, literally, we're inside the tactical operations center looking for this dog on all these different feeds to try and find it and, and i'm sitting right next to you know the, the the commander and and you know they're relaying back you know okay we're doing this keep it keep an eye on the timeline keep an eye on the time stay out there it's your call stay out there as long as you can until you can't and literally the sun was coming up when those guys had to pull and then you know index and this, let's end this thing because it's now not safe for us to yeah. be here and they did and we never got the dog back um, and, and it was, it was just a terrible, you know, it was a terrible ordeal because when, you know, I met Dave when he came off, um, and you know, he's, he loved fat dog, man. And, and they did an, he was part of this HBO special that they did. And he kept all these little, you know, these little, all this paraphernalia from the dog and, and he told the story. And, um, it was a true, there was a picture of me in there sitting on the, sitting on the couch with the dog. We were watching TV and, uh, but it was, it was such a sad story, but, but that was the kind, you, again, when, when you have to have that commitment though, 
Yeah. You know, you have to take ownership. You have to, to have a program, it, it had to work. You've got to have the right people, mm -hmm. right? And, and this, these were the people that we were using, that they were committed. They were committed to, to doing this the right way or what we construed to be the right way. And, and unfortunately, along with a whole lot of good, comes a whole lot of bad. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, Dave coming into the team room and, and, I, and I hugged him. And, and it was, you know, ah, oh, it was so sad. You know, I was, I, I know he was just wrecked and, and I was, you know, I was just, wow, man, this, this is powerful stuff, you know. And it's uh, an important point to point out that the dog isn't a, a, a tool, it's a member of your team. Yeah, he's right? a mate. Yeah, absolutely. He's a teammate. You know, I, I, I experienced that with Arco when I tried to push Arco with another handler. Mm -hmm. And every time I went out to the training, the dog would look at me <laughs> and, and I could only take it for about, you know, four days. And because we were going to pair him with my friend Chris, and I was like, "Sorry, Chris, I can't do that. Come here, Arco. Yeah, he's just not going to. You're going to. He's going to stay with me from now on." And I, I went out and bought Chris a dog, mm -hmm. a dog named Falco, who ended up was you know taken on a target as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it was so you end up you, with your dog. That's your teammate. You love your dog. I mean, as much. I mean. I think so. I yeah, mean, I, I know right? I did. I yeah, mean, I love absolutely. my dog. And I, and I know Dave him. did, too. Yeah. You know, most of the guys did. Yeah. Um, it was not unheard of for a dog handler to go through several dogs, though. And I, I think after that first one, do you think? I think maybe, you know, my first love, my first dog. I think yeah. that's a, I think there's there's some something viable there about that because, you know, the second dogs, you're a little bit harder, a little yeah. bit hardened from the first one. Or at least you're experienced by it. Like, you yeah. know what you're going to go through if you lose a dog. We had dog handlers that went through two, three, four dogs, you know. And when you say two, they, they went through them, that means they lost a dog in combat. Lost them in combat. It wasn't, yeah. they were, the dog wasn't transferred somewhere mm -hmm. else. No, yeah. no, no. They just lost them. Uh, at, I think our worst in, in the mid to late 2000s, which was really the bad war years, people were, were getting killed. Um, there was a lot of foreign fighters in Iraq and we were, I mean, I think one rotation, we lost five dogs and these dogs all died from GSWs. So gunshot wounds, gunshot, which, yeah. which means they are close proximity going head to head with hardened bad guys. And, you know, bullets don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. Bullets don't care how much training you have. Mm -hmm. They don't care, you know, what unit you're in. Mm -hmm. They'll, you know, they'll go through you you know, like anything else. Um, but because we were doing that, we were also advancing all of our TTPs, all of the equipment, all of the veterinary uh, things that we were doing. All of this was advancing with that. And, 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 and it was, you know, it, it was unbelievable. Uh, so I, I, got a, I got a number in 2010. I was in Tampa talking with the like the, the, the head SOCOM dog guy. I didn't even know there was one. I thought it would have been you. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was just part I was just part of USIS. I was I was just that at the army and, and I was a trainer at this time. And he told me a number and I don't know, but in ten years and, and basically the ten years of all of, you know, that's the the army, the navy, the Green Berets, the Rangers, Jason. all of us, all of all of use all of SOCOM, mm -hmm. they spent a hundred million dollars on dogs. That was in the number years? in 10 years, a hundred million. I don't, you know, but that's, you know, the kennel prices, sure. the, all the trainers, all of that, the, that, that was the number that he put on it. And I was just like, wow, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. a lot of money. Did you ever divide that to see how much it No, offered? no <laughs> like you know, that I, I wish we would have done a better job of that. Pat was always really big on archiving this. You mm -hmm. know, he's like, look guys, you need to tell the story. You need to make sure that you're writing all of this down. You know, the times that Steve and I would be sitting there doing the what if. Mm -hmm. how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to fix this? How are we going to do that? So this sort of morphed into one of the ways that we would, you know, the what if thing was I'd cut a deal with the command that I wanted to push the dog trainers as far forward as they would allow. And, and what I mean by that was... Um, I wanted them to deploy with their dogs. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to see what their dogs were doing. I wanted them to see the problems. I wanted them to be able to solve those problems. And when they started to solve the problems, I wanted all of that data sent back to me so that we can sit back and go, how do we fix this here? Mm -hmm. If they can fix it there, you fix it however you need to fix it. That's 
what you do. That, that became part of your job. That became part of a trainer's criteria. I had to hire guys that were capable of doing that. You know, that, that had the insight, that had the knowledge, that had the experience, that had the wherewithal to, to solve a problem. They became problem solvers. And, um, and that, I think, was one of the most successful things that we did um, when, when you start talking about compiling all the data because I no longer had to wait for the dog team to get back home to talk about a problem. How do you pick those guys? How do you find somebody who's already an operator? Maybe they're not dog savvy. Well, most of that was volunteer. Um, as far as, as the operator guy's concerned. So we, we also did, uh, operators don't grow on trees. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's always a manning problem. Um, and when you pull guys away from an assault force, it, it's a big deal. So not every element wanted to have an operator dog team. Um, so what we had to do was we had to figure out a way to man dog teams for everybody. So we created what's called a direct support dog team. And, and that is a guy who is just a dog handler. He does not do anything else. He handles a dog. And he is basically an attachment to that assault force. Um, and we picked, the, well, the, the only people that were handling dogs in the Army were MPs, mm -hmm. the military police. They are, you know, the, the, the big dog guys of the military. So we... Uh, in the kind of in the early days, we invited the, the, the Lackland Air Force Base, which is where they're stationed, the, the Lackland Command. We invited them to our training facility and, and we sat down and we had a discussion with them because there's always, you know, who controls the dogs in the military? Yeah. Well, Lackland does. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't control our dogs because we're special. Mm -hmm. um, but Pat had the foresight to get ahead of all of these problems. Um, so we invited them down and, and we sat in a room at a table and we talked back and forth. This is what we're doing. This is here. This is how it goes. You know, we want, this is what we want of you. And, and we already knew that they couldn't do what we wanted, but we were hoping that they would say, listen, we're, we're, we're not going to, this is not under, this isn't our, this isn't our purview. This isn't our ball of wax. We, we don't do this type of work. So we just wanted to know to make sure that you guys were doing, you know, that we quell any rumor mm -hmm. of, are we strapping an explosive to a dog and sending them in a building and cooking it off or something ridiculous mm -hmm. like that. But we weren't. And, um, and, and, and that was extremely helpful for us as far as support outside of SOCOM. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we did it as a courtesy. We wanted them. The meeting, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. that meeting was a courtesy. We wanted them to, to, you know, if, if it's a matter of just feeling it, it, interpret it as we're asking your permission or not. Right. I, I, we're going to do it anyway. But, you know, you take it how you need to. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was a very successful meeting. And, and w when we did that, I, got a I had a list of all the, 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 the our military dog handlers, the Army dog handlers. I, I had a list of names, and I was going out, and I was recruiting these guys. So we came back with about a dozen or so MPs. I mean, we so I would go to Germany, go to a big Air Force base, mm -hmm. go to go to Germany, get all of the MP dog handlers to come in, go to El Paso, get all of them to come into a room, and I would pitch them a dog handler job for SOCOM. And uh, it was this is what you're going to do, you know. And, and it was funny because I I, I kind of knew. Yeah, I was the green suitor at one point, so I knew what they did. I knew about basic training, and I knew about AIT, and I knew, you know, the range time that they got. And, and I would open it up, you know, something like this would be, be into a room, and i say, you know, my name is, is Shannon Krieger, um, you know, Sergeant First Class. Um, how many people shot 100 rounds today? Nobody would raise their hand. I'd raise mine. You know? <laughs> right. How many people are going to shoot 100, miles, 100 rounds tomorrow? I keep my hand up. How many shot 100 rounds yesterday? You know, that, that kind of thing. Nobody would raise their hand. Um, and then I just started to sell them on the, the perks, mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, TDY money. How, how fast do you get it back? Because I get mine back probably in a day or two. They get, you know, net plus 30 or something mm -hmm. like that. And <laughs> we have people to do these things for us. And, and then I was like, well, what I'm doing is I'm looking for dog teams. I'm looking for guys who want to be dog handlers for us. And, and I had all, oh, excuse me, I had all of them there. 
I had, you know, men and women and, and I had all of them there. And I actually had a couple of females come up to me and ask me if, you know, if, and I had no idea what to say, Mm -hmm. you know, about that. I I was like, (laughs) yeah, you, you can come to the tryout, you know? Okay. (laughs) I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I had no idea. That was, no, no, I, I, but, but, you know, so we got, we gather all these guys and we would do a, uh, a board and we would interview them and, and, what I looked for was the dog team or the dog handler that was like, yeah, I, I work with the local. I, I go out to the local cops and work with them all the time. Mm-hmm. That's who I want. I want that guy right there. Gotcha. That's the dude I want. I want the guy who's taking the initiative, who's going out and doing things for himself. And we had we had four or five guys that were like that. Yeah. Yeah. I started my own club. I want him. Yep. You know, and, and that's the guy that I wanted. And we brought these guys in and um, put them through a program this mock little selection process. And, uh, you know, we, we told them, you know, dress for success and give me your best effort, you know? Um, and they would knock, you know, knock on a door. They'd go through, and, and we slept, we sleep, deprived them of sleep and food and did all this stuff um, to try and trip them up. And, and we did things that we, know, that we, we knew they were gonna fail. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to see what they did. So did you want to see them, did you want to see how they handled the failure or did you want to see if they would fail? No, I wanted to see how they would handle the failure. I, I knew most of them were going to fail. Yeah. I wanted to see how they listened. You know, so it, it would be like, so here's the thing. I, I would take a, um, a paddle board in, in a pool. Just put a bunch of them down there. So, okay, you got to go back and forth as many times as you can. 30 seconds, ready, go. And guys would be dra- grabbing paddle boards and other things, and there'd be dudes that just jump in the water and start swimming. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, okay, what'd you do that for? You didn't tell me what stroke to use. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want him. Mm. You know, these these were the kind of the things that we were doing. I also there was a book called How Dogs Learn, and, it, and it's basically mm-hmm. a very it was written by a psychologist and a dog person. I can't for the life of me remember the authors, but I. This was a dog that was operant conditioning for the beginner. I mean, it talks about, you know, uh, re- positive reinforcement. Reshaping. Negative, and yes, that, yeah. reshaping and ex- extinction bursts and all these cool things. And I gave them this book and said, you got to have a report written by tomorrow. And I wanted to know who was actually going to try and read it. Mm-hmm. I wanted to know who was going to peruse it, who was going to, how they were going to do it, because I knew they weren't going to finish. And you could stay up all night. And this was after a full day of working. <laughs> so you come in, you're going to have lunch. Here's your homework. I want to report on this book tomorrow. And it's going to be an oral report. And, and they would come in. And, and, and first, the first thing I would ask them is, who's the author? <laughs> who right. wrote that book? You know, I wanted to know, did they read it? Mm-hmm. And it was a guy there. His name is Bill Shockley. He, he's, he ended up being one of our handlers. He was funny, man. He, he, he goes, I stayed up all night reading this thing. I was like, you stayed up all night reading it. Did you? For real? You know? Uh-huh. I was like, come on. <laughs> you did? And he did. He, did. he stayed wow. up all night. Yeah. You know, most of the guys were like, well, you know, to be honest with you, no, don't say that. Yeah, yeah. Because then I'm, you know, then I'm going to think you're not being <laughs> yeah, honest. Being yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just read each chapter. I read the, like the first couple pages of every chapter. It's like, hey, okay, that I like that. That's yeah. a way to do it. And you know, or were there guys that just said, can't, yeah, can't do it, not gonna. Didn't really want him. Yeah. Um, and we got four or five. We had four or five really good guys, um, and they did unbelievably tremendous work for us. Mm. They really did. It was it was a successful program. We took a dog handler and made him into a soldier that could operate in that capacity. He wasn't kicking doors. We weren't asking him to do that. He wasn't, he, they weren't doing operate. They weren't doing operator things because they weren't operators. But the biggest thing was they were accepted because look, man, if you're an operator, you don't want non-operator people around you. That's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. And nobody wants to do that. But when, when they looked at the value that they were bringing to the table, it, I think that it was, you know, it was you know, a, a really cool, tremendous thing. Sure. Um, and uh, they were highly successful. The other thing that we did to, to basically combat this, this manning issue was we took uh, guys who didn't make it as operators who were asked to stay. We gave them the option to become a dog handler. So we had a lot of Army Rangers. We had a lot of Green Berets. 
um, guys who were super successful high-speed soldiers who just, for whatever reason, didn't have it uh, on that day mm -hmm. and, and got asked to, you know, sorry, you can't be an operator. We used them. And, um, and we were, they, these guys were tremendously successful as well. Mm -hmm. And, and they were, uh, you know, they were super, you know, really accepted in, in, in what they brought to the table. And they, they bit dozens of people and found dozens of, of IEDs. And, and they were, you know, again, if you weren't success, if you weren't doing good things on a target, you got, I'm sorry, you can't stay. You're, mm -hmm. you're not what we're looking for. And, uh, and they did that. So again, to, to, to fall into that, that three things that you got to have, we had the good people. We were finding these good people, but we were vetting them. We were vetting them really hard. And, you know, we would make them run an oak course that they had never seen before. And, you know, the guys were falling off of it and getting hurt. And, you know, they would try and get back up and work. And, and, but we vetted them really, really well. And, and they did wonderful things for us. Um, and, and they were a big part of the success of that program. And, and I'm, I'm still friends with a lot of them right now. Um, the other thing was uh, the catalyst, the timing. That was the, the, one of the things that we talked about earlier. We had these, these things, these, time, these times that, that were just 9-11, huge catalyst for us. It, boom, pushed it into us. We had, pur we had purchased a, uh, uh, a Belgian Taverne one of our first turfs that we had ever had. I tested him. I was at Kenny's, grabbed him from this heavy-handed Dutch guy. Leave this dog alone. And he was a, a, his name was Ewan, super nice, wonderful dog. And um, he went out with a, an operator dog handler, and they were doing the Uday and Kuse hit. And the dog went up the stairs and rounded a corner and basically ate a machine gun. Mm -hmm. And the guys that were behind him subsequently didn't eat the machine gun mm -hmm. and um when we did that that again that timing that was a catalyst for us that really solidified the use of a dog and the use of the dog was not to take a bullet sure. for a dude but at the end of the day it is that that was his job his job is when push comes to shove if we are facing imminent danger that layer there's going to be a layer in that onion peel there is going to be a layer that's going to protect the human and that layer for us were these canines these combat assault dogs that's what we named them cads that that was the other thing how we differentiated them from a patrol dog was these were combat assault dogs they were assaulting a structure and they weren't just wasn't just surround a place and go in and send a building and make an announcement or anything like that right. this was go in and get some yeah. with bad guys and um Locate, dominate. Yeah, locate, dominate, and it, and it was it was tremendous, tremendous work, and and it was ridiculously satisfying for me. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end at the end of all of this, um, <clears throat> I was uh, I was a dog trainer. I was you know I was the dog handler. I became a trainer. I got hurt. Became a dog trainer. I became a uh, a, a contractor, and. In the middle of all of this, they had made me a, a, a GS employee, which was really sort of a, you can stay here forever if you want to. And in 2010, I was de I deployed back to Afghanistan for the first time since 01 when I got hurt. As a handler? As, well, as a trainer. Okay. And, and, and uh, as a trainer, I stepped off the airplane, you know, and I'm in Bagram and I'm going to where I'm going. I'm riding, I'm taking this helicopter ride. And I'm just sitting here going, man, what the heck am I doing? You know, what, 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 what is this feeling? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it was, you know, this full circle thing, mm -hmm. you know, you come back full circle. <laughs> this is where it's going to end because this is where it began. I, you know, that, that's certainly a romantic view mm -hmm. of it, I think. Um, but I did, uh, I did that rotation. Um, and I was, in our compound, we had had rangers with us, and I was working really heavily with the ranger dog teams. They had one of their dogs got killed in a gunfight, a, a GSW, and um, our guys were, you know, were just out there crushing it. They were just doing such good work. And when we got back from that deployment, this was 2010, 11 time frame. In 2009, I got married. And I think that probably had a lot to do with it was before when I was gone, I was single. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. But now I'm married and I have a wife at home. 
and I didn't want to be gone anymore. And I came back to the compound and, and I, you know, had a con- I actually, one of the first things I did was I went and spoke to Pat McCauley, who was, you know, in charge of something at the time. And I sat, I sat down in his office and, and I'm like, uh, you know, I need to talk to you for a minute. He's always been a mentor to me. And, and he's like, yeah, what's up, dude? And I told him and he said, look, man, you, I, I, I'm surprised you've been here this long, you know, for, for all of this stuff. You know, I, my whole thing was I, I, I felt this huge desire to contribute mm-hmm. because the regret that I had when I left the Army, I was, you know, I felt like a quitter. But I had these dogs to come back, to bring me back to, to reality, to bring me back to I can contribute this way. And, and that, was, that was just a godsend for me. Wow. Um, and I'm sitting in Pat's office talking to him, and he's like, look, man, you know, <laughs> You know, you've done everything that you can do. You, you know, he, he was the one who told me, he said, you know, you've saved more lives as a dog person than you ever would have as an operator. And, you know, as being a junior operator, I just wasn't there. I missed, I missed it. That was my problem. I missed all the cool, what I thought was the cool stuff with my friends. And, um, but I got to be there just in another, you know, wearing a different hat. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, it was so, so much fun. Um, but when I got back from Afghanistan that time, um, I, I was finished, man. I, I, it was, it was, it was scary because it happened as easily as it did when I knew it was the right thing to do being there. You know, it was like, okay, I'm done. You knew. It, yeah, I knew. Yeah. And, and the first time that I, then when I medically retired, I, I didn't leave on my terms. And I think that was the big point. Mm-hmm. That was the big difference was these are my terms right. and, and I'm, I'm done. You know, so I put my two weeks. I went to I went to the the, the current guy's name was Bill Suka, <laughs> Wild Bill, and, and I said, Bill, I'm done, bro. I, I don't know what else to tell you. And they had made me a GS employee, which was a big deal. It yeah. was a really big deal, and I I could have stayed there forever, mm-hmm. you know, I really could have. And, and I, I was like, you know, everybody thought, oh man, you're chasing the dollar. He's doing this. He's doing that. There's a friend of mine, he's Joel, the guy who bought me the bag of chocolate. Mm-hmm. He goes, he goes, look, you you guys just don't. Shannon's just bored. And, and that's sort of where I was. And, and the, the, the thing about when you are a member of SOCOM, every time you drive up to that gate, if you don't feel some form of gratitude, you're in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. And, and that is a horrible beast to work for because he will chew you up and spit you out and, and, and only say, gimme, 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 gimme. Mm-hmm. You know? And in uh, that place, they treated me so, I was treated so well. I really was. I was treated extremely well. And, and it was horrific for me when I turned my creds in and I walked down the hall for the last time, walked out of my old squadron bay. And uh, a friend of mine, I asked, I said, hey, dude, I'm going to walk through. Is that cool? He's like, dude, you're, you're a member here. You can go in and out as you want. And I was like, appreciate it. And uh, I walked out of the bay and closed that door. It's this big, huge metal door. And it closes and the realization that I couldn't get back in there if I wanted to just slammed me in the face and I was so bummed I was walking to my car just pissed off for for whatever reason I got angry it's like what am I doing Mm -hmm. what am I doing I couldn't get back in that building if I wanted to I've got to let me back in (laughs) no dude you gave up your creds you're done no more driving up to the front of the building no more of that you're done and I went home and, and, you know, my wife met me at the door and she was like, you, are you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. This was the right thing. And uh, I started, you know, kind of found some me time at this point. And, uh, and that's, you know, kind of when I just stopped deploying, stopped doing things like that. And, um, you know, just, just tried to figure out what was next. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about that in the next, next, next time you come. Yeah. So, and, and that's, so that's what I did. So I ended up, uh, I ended up, you know, being retired for a while and then had a, had a baby. My wife and I had a child and I was like, so much for retirement. I got to go back to work. (laughs) What, what, you know, what did I want to do? So, and, uh, you know, we can talk about that. Yeah, we will. Uh, Just to end this, um, and to end this chapter of what we're talking about, where does the, um, CAD program stand now, the, the, the combat assault dogs? Well, uh, they are currently 
Wow. So they are they're still going strong. You know, their their dogs deploying every time anybody deploys their mm -hmm. their dog teams and and you know, most of the trainers that I hired or that I had a hand in hiring are still there. Wow. You know, Stoops is still there. All the guys that we hired. Um, one, one thing, one of the things when, when we started, uh, and I, I want to throw this out there, uh, one of the guys that I hired was Mike Reaver. And, and Mike was, was, you know, part of Adler Horse International here, sure. in, here in California. And Mike was funny because, you know, he worked for his dad and his dad, you know, Dave. big Dave, daddy Dave Reaver. I yeah. used to love Dave Reaver. You know, I, I would sit back and, you know, drink coffee all day with him. Just go in and get a, go in and get an espresso, <laughs> you know. And we drink five or six shots of espresso in a training day. You know, my heart's, you know, and Dave is this <laughs> gorilla-armed old guy, you know, who's drinking, who's been bitten more than anybody. And I asked him, I said, Dave, uh, how would you feel about me hiring Mike? Um, and... You know what? What would that be like for you? And he's like, "Well, you know, Mike's his own man." You know, it's like, "Well, what I was hoping is that he was not going to say, Shannon, don't do it for me,' mm -hmm. because I don't think he would have. But I was hoping that he wouldn't, because I was going to anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, we we had, we had received, we had established a relationship with with the Reavers, and and I brought Mike in when we did our the first school for the SAS, and and it was you know we had so much fun, and it was a tremendous success. And at the end of that school, Mike went back home. And lo and behold, you know, less than a year later, I picked him back up full time. Oh, and he moved to North Carolina permanently. And, uh, and you know, we still, we buy dogs from him. He, I mean, the, he, is, he is like one of the up and coming dog guys. Mm -hmm. You know, he's one of the younger guys that are out there that are, are doing it for real and, and have done it for real. And yeah. he deployed with the squadrons. He went out with his, you know, he went with his team and deployed forward and, and did, you know, ridiculously cool dog stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's sort of where, you know, the cool, cool guys doing cool things with dog, with dogs actually came from. It was built on all of those people, on all of that support, on, on all of, all of that timing that, that happened. And, uh, and, you know, grateful to have been a part of it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I look back at it in retrospect and I miss it every day. And, uh, how could you not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at least you lived it. How many people are in these fantasies where they want to live it or, you know, they want to be whatever this other person, but you're, you're that guy. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah. And it's cool. It is. Yeah. And, and there, you know, we can let's kind of tap around one thing here. So we had a lot of guys in our shop. You know, we had a lot of dog guys in our shop and they're out there now. They're not there in the shop anymore. And they're out there trying to monetize a lot of things. And I think that that's great. Mm -hmm. But but just don't don't tell me that you were the first. That's the problem that I have. Yeah. I, I have a problem. I mean, uh, th there's stories about, you know, you're, you know, uh, a guy walk you walk a guy who's got a canine t-shirt on he's in the airport or whatever and you, you hey man what's how you tell me about that you know and it's well yeah you know i started this dog program over here i'm like did you now really that's Wrong it guy you know, they yeah and it's right. like you know yeah well this this guy was you know combat this combat that you know uh operator guy and got hurt and in 05 began this program and now Mm -mm. Now the program <laughs> began long before that is when the program started right. and we templated it and, and we gave it away, which is what we were supposed to do. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud we did that. Yeah, that was sure. the right thing to do. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show and Stoops and I talked about it because a lot of people come out now on the internet. I mean, everybody's a dog expert. Everybody's the special ops guys, but you started this there's no there's no denying that that you are at the forefront of this yeah i was like the third guy and, yeah. and, and i i've been i've been actually been very adamant about that because i was the face of the program for a long time when pat and alan stepped back mm -hmm. and, and they went on to do other things and came back to the program but because you know when my status changed from being active duty to being a civilian they had me out everywhere i was mm -hmm. all over the world mm -hmm looking for dogs looking for train looking for a, looking for a technique yeah you know looking for something that's going to save a life and and i i used to tell everybody do not get caught up in this magic pixie dust mm -hmm. because it does not exist there is not one technique that's out there that's all encompassing and and i because i've looked for it 
and and I figure we figured out along the way. It's like let's you know Steve and I again. Let's go break some eggs mm -hmm. and let's go make an omelet. Yeah. And and some of the omelets that we made were just so much fun mm -hmm. and so tremendous that uh, you know there there's there's techniques and tactics and procedures that are being used today across the SOCOM yeah. spectrum that we initiate yeah. and 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 that that is unbelievably satisfying for yeah. me you know and, and and not to you know the the, I, the two top tactical dog guys in the world and of course I'm, I'm stoops is one of them and for a reason stoops i hired him in 04 and he's still there so and it's 2022 so that's 18 years of being on a front line on on a on a tier one front line okay and, and the other guy is is Reaver. He as a, as a tactical dog guy. The, the other trainers that are at that are all over the place. Yeah. They are great tactical guys too. But if I have to look at who I would lean on first, it would be those two. Mm -hmm. Because number one, I hired them. Yeah. I found them. I, I, I saw, I was looking for something specific and I saw it in, in both of them. And, and I was pissed when Mike left. You know, Mike left. Sure. And when Mike went left, when Mike left the unit, he went back home. He was always going to be, sure. you know, the the the. He was in line to take the throne, and yeah. I knew that. Sure. But but I, I was bummed when he left, and 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 I'm I'm super happy that I still have a relationship with all these guys, um, because uh, it, it to me is, um, you know, it's important. And sure. uh, and, and what we'll talk about next is you know the 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 the, the other relationships and how they extended in, in, into the federal right you know canine stuff yeah that's gonna be some cool cool talks all right let's get a break yes thank Perfect. you okay.